Hello, my name is Ken Kinter, and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. The purpose of this presentation is to provide an introduction or review to personality disorders. And as always, my contact information is on this first slide. So we got a lot of ground uh, to cover in a short period of time. We're going to talk about some of the diagnostic and clinical issues regarding personality disorders, specifically about how they are different from the uh, traditional uh, mental illnesses. We're also going to talk about some of the behaviors that come along with these personality disorders and challenges in terms of treatment. Uh, but we're also going to throw in some other stuff about uh, dealing with people with personality disorders in your personal life as well, because it's also a challenge there. So just to start off, in the past, personality disorders were considered on their own axis. You see the, the dsm 4 was the diagnostic manual until 2013, followed by the dsm 5 uh, There's another PowerPoint presentation about that, if you have any questions about that. And most mental illnesses were categorized on axis 1. However, personality disorders, because of some different aspects about them, uh, was grouped with mental retardation on axis 2. Now we don't necessarily have that anymore. So the old terms of axis two uh, disorders and cluster B and all that kind of stuff, some of that has gone uh, by the wayside. Now, uh, even though they were split off, there, there was a clinical reason for that. Personality disorders differ from the other mental illnesses in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, they're enduring nature, they're not episodic, and also that it's part of that person's inner experience. A personality disorder is as ingrained as that person's personality. It doesn't mean it can't change, but it's not something that goes away like a symptom. Uh, the symptoms that these people experience, very different from the culture, tend not to move, start very young, uh, and tends to be very um, stable uh, over time. They, they really don't respond that well to treatment for a couple of reasons that we will talk about. Um, one of these things is there are no medication for personality disorders. You, you can't medicate a personality disorder like you medicate depression or anxiety. So the medications that people with personality disorders are on are for these secondary symptoms like anxiety or depression, not for the personality disorder itself. Personality disorders are also egocentric. Okay, that's a really great term. What that really means is that the symptoms are okay with the person. They like the way they are. They like who they are. This is part of who they are. Most people would identify depression and anxiety as, as, as ego dystonic, which means I don't like the way I feel. I don't like these things, so I want to change them. If it's ego syntonic, the problem isn't with the person, it's with everybody else. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Now, personality disorders are very prevalent, 9 to 15% prevalence in the United States. As we'll talk about, that number goes up for certain types of personality disorders, or if you work in mental health or inpatient settings, it goes up quite a bit. Uh, we're also going to talk about how uh, people have contact with people with personality disorders in their social life, and I am pretty darn sure that I'm going to be describing somebody's exes here uh, as far as some of the personality disorders. Now, of course, your exes may be having the same conversation about you, so we'll take that into consideration. So personality disorders are grouped into three clusters. Uh, cluster A is nicknamed the eccentric, and it it captures uh, personality disorders that have more of a psychotic uh, feel about them. Paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal. Uh, they, it, they imply a paranoia and also sort of a disconnection from people. Cluster B, which we're gonna be spending most of uh, this presentation talking about is the dramatic, antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. There's also a cluster C, which is fearful, uh, which contains avoidant, depressant, de dependent, and obsessive compulsive. Really important note, obsessive compulsive personality disorder has nothing in common with obsessive compulsive disorder, the counting, the checking, and all that kind of stuff. So even though the, the name is very similar, that is an easy mistake to make, don't make it. And then NOS stands for not otherwise specified if there's a combination or, or uh, people have elements of more than one. So we're gonna start by talking about borderline personality uh, disorder and the, the good metaphor for this is the roller coaster. Lots of very intense uh, ups and downs. So the formal definition here, pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal uh, relationships. Um, and the major points of this are, and you need to have five of these to have uh, the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, frantic efforts to avoid real or perceived abandonment, the pattern of, of unstable and intense relationships, 
and a really unstable sense of who that person is. Impulsivity in a variety of areas. Recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, and threats. Also self-mutilating behavior. We're going to talk more about that. Affective instability. A person can literally be explosive. They can spin on a dime. Uh, if anything happens, the response is completely out of proportion. And chronic feelings of emptiness. And that's sort of the metaphor for somebody with borderline personality disorder. It's like a hole they have within themselves, which they try to fill with anything, addictions, uh, sex, and also other people, always trying to put that relationship in there to fulfill themselves. Uh, inappropriate intense displays of anger, some paranoid ideation. Um, as we mentioned, this is up to two to 6% of people in the United States, but can be much higher in inpatient uh, facilities. The majority are female, a couple, but, uh, but certainly not all. A couple other points to bring up about um, borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality disorder, usually the self-mutilation is the giveaway. Non-suicidal, um, their attempts to hurt themselves, not to kill themselves. So lots of cuts on the arms, maybe burning, um, writing the names of, of, of old partners in their arm with some sort of blade, things along those lines. Um, so it's this roller coaster, and, and part of the, the, the idea of borderline personality disorder is when they first meet someone, it begins this intense relationship and that person goes up on a pedestal, but then at some point that person's gonna have to say no to them, and then they get pulled down off the pedestal, and then the cycle begins again with someone else. So sound like anyone we know, sound like anyone we've dated, moving on. Uh, we do have to make some differentiations. Personality disorders are difficult to diagnose because they look like a lot of other things, including each other. So a lot of the personality disorders look very similar. Uh, they also resemble many other things like bipolar disorder, major depression, uh, types of addiction. And just because somebody's manipulative doesn't mean they have borderline personality disorder. Um, I think it's a really important point. If someone's manipulating, they're manipulating for something. A person with borderline personality disorder is like that all the time. They don't turn it on and off. And in a way, it's, it's not adolescent behavior, but very often it resembles adolescent behavior. You might think you're looking at somebody that's acting like a teenager decades later, and, and it, because it really does resemble that to a, certain, um, to a certain degree. Now, very often borderline personality disorder comes from uh, trauma-filled environments, history of severe physical abuse, uh, severe sexual abuse, severe neglect. I mean, uh, it, it's created in a, a very pressure filled environment. That hole was put there. Um, negating relationships. And I didn't know this uh, for quite a while in the field. I always wondered why it was called borderline personality. What borderline what? And the answer was it was the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. It was so severe that it was judged to be more severe than, say, depression or anxiety or, or the neurotic disorders, but it wasn't quite as it exhibited quite so a profound alteration in reality testing as the psychotic disorders did. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. Uh, and unfortunately, and we'll see this with all the personality disorders, there's a stigma that goes along with the name, a person being referred to as a borderline. If someone's being referred to as a borderline, then their behavior is sort of being dismissed and very often using that label pejoratively is used as grounds for denial of treatment. We're not going to get this person a quicker appointment. They're just being a borderline. If that's happening, that is a mistake. That is, that is us utilizing a stigma toward that person, uh, toward their, uh, not, not in their best interest. So where does this come from? Uh, there is some evidence that there may be some genetics involved in it. Um, certainly the environmental, environmental aspects that we talked about and or, or most often an overlap between the two, a combination of genetic predisposition. Uh, anecdotally, I've seen a lot of people who have personality disorders who are the children of people that have profound mental illness. So whether it's something to do with the parenting of someone who's ill in that moment, the impact that it has, I can't really say. I'm sure there's better research on that. But we usually look for a combination of genetic and environmental um, aspects. So as I mentioned before, one of the biggest challenges of working with people with borderline personality disorder is they are champion staff splitters. They pick their favorites, you're my best friend, and then this other person is terrible, um, and they, they pair staff off against each other. All the personality disorders do this to a certain degree, but someone with borderline personality disorder is sort of famous for it. 
There's also that risk of explosive self-injurious behavior or explosive violence. Also explosive, uh, I would say sexually inappropriate behavior. Uh, where I used to work, we had a woman who's diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She took off all of her clothes and laid down on her case manager's desk at a day program and waited for him to return to his desk. Uh, I walked in the office first, spun on my heel, went out and got our female supervisor, and then we handled the situation from there. But that kind of thing. Um, can be, the, the acting out behavior can be very exhausting for staff. Uh, it can be very personal. They can come, they, they can come right at a person in their week you know, in their weak spot or, or notice something about them. Constantly testing boundaries. Um, very often many admissions, a lot of use of emergency services. The other issue that's going on is that borderline personality disorder seldom travels alone. So you have to deal with all this other stuff as well. There could be eating disorders, there could be addictions going along with it. And you also have to deal with the fallout of all these relationships that the person's constantly going into and out of. And usually, I would say with people with borderline personality disorder, when a relationship ends, even if that relationship was one or two weeks long, it very often results in either parasuicidal behavior, the self-mutilating behavior, or actual suicidal behavior. Now, I, I hope I didn't paint too grim of a picture. There are treatments available for people with borderline personality disorder. Dialectical behavior therapy uh, is very helpful. Um, if people do have insight that they have a problem and they stay with a the therapist for a period of time, they can see what they do, uh, that these things can be turned around. Uh, so they can get help. The hard part is them seeing that they need help and then also just being in a position of being safe enough uh, to get that help. And again, people with borderline personality disorder can rack up a frightening number of hospitalizations, but the hospital takes care of the crisis, not the underlying personality disorder. So. The person with borderline personality disorder gets in a relationship with somebody for two weeks, the, the person breaks up with them, they become suicidal, they get hospitalized, but then they're right back out again. So they can be a big part of the revolving door that we've, uh, that we've talked about. So treatment threatening behaviors, uh, a little bit of an overview about, uh, about DBT is you, you prioritize the acting out behavior. Which of those acting out behaviors are life threatening? Which one of those are therapy or treatment threatening? Which ones impact their quality of life, and then ultimately, how can you increase that person's skills replacing maladaptive behaviors with helpful ones? So you work your way from these big things, the suicidality, to the things they do to possibly blow up treatment, and then hopefully to the point of improving their lives, and you put all of their behaviors into these hierarchies. I did not do that justice, but just to give you a quick, it's definitely worth looking up about DBT, and we have a resource at the end. So next up is antisocial personality disorder. I really struggled to come up with some good pictures here because I, I figured any politician's picture I put up there would get me in trouble with half the audience. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm, we got our good friend Charlie Manson up here and then I'm gonna let you handle what picture. Uh, and, and sorry to pick on politicians. I, I happen to think that antisocial personality disorder uh, suits politicians particularly well. Uh, we'll see how that works out as the description goes. And I, I, I invite, uh, different different views on that. So let's talk about antisocial personality disorder. Uh, now this one, another challenge in this, just like borderline is named badly, borderline what? Antisocial doesn't mean what it means in the general world. Antisocial normally thinks, oh, well, they don't like people. Well, that's not what antisocial means in terms of antisocial personality disorder. What it means is, to oversimplify it, it means that that person doesn't really have a conscience. They don't feel bad about doing things that, that, that may hurt other people. Um, so here's the, the, the description. Failure to conform to social norms and laws, repeated arrests, repeated deception, lying for profit or just for pleasure, just for the heck of it. Impulsivity, aggressiveness, uh, the use of violence or the use of violence in terms of uh, threats, disregard uh, for safety of self or others, totally unable to manage with life, the routine of life, whether it's work or just staying out of legal trouble. And the lack of remorse is the kicker. We all have that little voice in our head that tells us when there's something that we wanna do, why we shouldn't do it. For some reason, that voice does not engage uh, with people with antisocial personality disorder. I worked in a, a, in a county jail and I worked with a person who had killed another person with a shovel and just walked up to a total stranger on the sidewalk and beat them to death with a shovel. Didn't really have a reason why and didn't feel bad about it. 
felt bad about the fact that they were locked up and they weren't free and all that kind of stuff. But the actual death didn't bother them at all. They slept well that night. Um, and just having that level of, of disengagement emotionally from other people's feelings or needs. So as you can see, uh, the populations are higher in institutional settings. I did see some information that people with antisocial personality disorder tend to be dead or institutionalized by 40. And again, the, this group is uh, particularly male. There's a lot of literature out there on the term psychopath or sociopath. Uh, this doesn't go into, I'm not going to go into that in much further detail. I would really try to stay away from those terms that, that are overtly pejorative. A person with antisocial personality disorder, as a, even as opposed to saying, oh, an antisocial. Again, there's a lot of overlap with the other personality disorders, uh, some overlap with addiction. And of course, just because someone manipulates doesn't mean they have a personality disorder. Same deal with adolescent behavior. Uh, maybe a lot of us showed some mild antisocial tendencies when we were in our adolescence and had much more of a, a feeling about what we wanted to do than other people's uh, rights and feelings. But uh, we grew out of it. The person with antisocial personality disorder doesn't necessarily so much. So a lot of similarities to the other personality disorders, very often trauma-filled environments, mentioned mostly male, same deal with relationships. There is some uh, evidence that, there, that part of this may be biologically based in terms of the part of the brain that's supposed to engage that stops us from doing these things doesn't engage with them. Either the, you know, the amygdala is over-firing or, or, or that part of the, the brain that just stops you from making these impulsive decisions that might satisfy an impulse in the moment but are, are going to be long-term very bad. That part just doesn't engage uh, there's a lot of research available on that, but I have not seen anything too uh, definitive about it. The challenges of people with antisocial personality disorder. It, the thing that, that we really have to watch are a couple different things. There's always the risk of violence and the threat of violence, especially to accomplish a goal. Uh, the downing a duck thing, that's an interesting Google search. Check that out when you get the chance. So think about a person with antisocial personality disorder as having predatory tendencies. So the job of a predator is to know prey. So the job of the predator is to split prey off. Think about how this works in the animal kingdom. You run in a herd of gazelle. One of the gazelle makes a turn and goes away from the herd. That's the one you're going to run down. Uh, downing a duck is another term for grooming, where you're grooming someone for behavior. So you're asking someone you, you, you develop a personal relationship with staff, then you start asking them for things that you shouldn't have. You start out very small, but then you work bigger, bigger, bigger to the point where you can get that person in trouble. And then now you have a power differential on them. Another risk with people with antisocial personality disorder is they work with others to do their dirty work. Uh, we had at a hospital that I worked at, we had a client who bribed another client a couple packs of cigarettes to start a fight. So while that other client started a fight, all of the staff responded except for the nurse that that original person wanted to get. So then he attacked the nurse while all the other staff was available with the fight. The whole idea of the fight was a diversion. So that's how that, that works. Very often people with antisocial personality disorder will not act out with violence impulsively. They'll plan it. How about a night shift? How about a hospital how, or a holiday? How about waiting until there's very low staffing on the unit to do something. So it's much more opportunistic and planned than just uh, impulsive. And, and that whole point, uh, we were very concerned at the hospitals where I work about people with antisocial personality disorder preying on new people coming in, separating them from the staff, forming personal relationships with them, and then either using friendliness or a manipulation or the threat of violence to get something from them. Very difficult to treat people with antisocial personality disorder. Again, they like the way they are. They don't see any reason to change. The problem is everyone else's. So again, we have some real challenges here. There is not a lot in the way of treating people with antisocial personality disorder short of the, the limit setting uh, piece that we just talked about. So now the first two personality disorders we talked about, uh, if you work in an inpatient setting, you will see people with borderline personality disorder and people with antisocial personality disorder in probably larger numbers. Uh, we made a later addition to put narcissistic personality disorder in this as well. Not as much because of what you see in inpatient settings, but I'm guessing that there's much more of this in your personal life. Um, many people that I've worked with struggle with 
coworkers, colleagues, supervisors, and people in the community that have narcissistic traits. Maybe not full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, but we wanted to add that in. So again, similar to the other personality disorders, a, pa a pervasive pattern from early adolescence on. Now this one's geared much more toward grandiosity, preoccupation of success and power, belief that they're special, but basically better than everyone else, require a lot of admiration, they're entitled, and they will exploit other people, not the same way that people with antisocial personality disorder will. I'm very concerned with other people being jealous uh, of them. And the name comes from uh, the, old, uh, the old myth about Narcissus. Narcissus was so beautiful uh, that he fell in love with his own reflection and drowned and then became that lovely flower. So if Narcissus is, if you're, if you're familiar with the Narcissus as a flower, that's the story uh, where it comes from. It's a, it's a great old uh, myth. So again, more people with um, narcissistic personality disorder are male. Uh, there's, a high, there's a prevalence in the community. I have not seen it to the same level in inpatient settings as I've, as I've seen and read about in the community. So I actually think that people that have narcissistic tendencies actually are pretty successful because they're all about themselves. They're never gonna be bothered um, you know, taking care of anyone else. So I think there's a lot uh, to say about that, where people with narcissistic tendencies, if you believe that you're better than everyone else, you are going to be a very good self-promoter and you're going to move ahead, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do well uh, with other people. So, uh, so the whole idea of narcissism is that a person will, um, they're basically going to uh, kiss up to the people above them and be very demeaning to the people below them and are not an easy peer either because they're more likely to take the lion's share of the credit for anything that's done and avoid the blame. And again, I, if I were gonna summarize narcissism, it would be, it's all about me. And a person that it's all about me is pretty tough to deal with in the long term. So the discussions that we had about these personality disorders, much, off, much more often it's more about management and facilitating treatment, not treatment per se. The person isn't interested in treatment. If they like who they are, there's very little desire uh, to change that. Another really strong point is not everyone who manipulates has a personality disorder. Manipulation is something that you do when you're powerless. Um, so a couple tips about dealing with that is, first of all, they're not lying to you. Don't make it personal. If, they weren't if you weren't there, they'd be lying to someone else. So let's take the personal part right out of it. The other point is it's worked for them. It's helped them at some point. This person's gone through years where whatever they're doing now has worked for them at some point. So just because it isn't working now doesn't mean they're just gonna stop doing it. And they haven't learned a new way yet. They may not have learned that the old way isn't working so well either. So if you've seen any of the other uh, presentations, if you haven't, I encourage you to, on stages of change, you've seen this before. Uh, the reason that this is on there now is that people that are, have personality disorders are very likely to be in a stage of pre-contemplation, which is the, I don't have a problem, you have a problem. For most people with personality disorders, they don't see their personality traits or subsequent behaviors as a problem. Other people need to acclimate and change to accomplish that. And that's why we talked about most of the treatment per se is more about limit setting than anything else. And the goal is ultimately to move them into these higher stages of change. So here's the definition of pre-contemplation. I don't have a problem, you have a problem. And if they don't have a problem, they're not gonna be willing to do much about it. So what you're gonna get more often is resistance behaviors. And that's everything from uh, lying to overt violence. Uh, the person is just trying to get past you so that they can go back to doing what they were doing before. One other piece to, to bring up is gaslighting. Uh, gaslighting, I, I, the, there's been a lot more of that, a lot more awareness of gaslighting than there has been in the past. There's a classic movie from the 40s about gaslighting. Uh, there's also a great Carol Burnett sketch called Wrong Number that has a great example of gaslighting in it. And it's when a person sort of lies and manipulates and twists what a person's saying to take the heat off of them and what they're doing and to put it back on everybody around them. If you've ever seen those TV shows where they feature interventions, you usually see a lot of gaslighting where the person who has having the intervention is making it everybody else's problem and everyone else's reason. Like, I don't have a problem with drugs. You think I have a problem with drugs. 
So something along those lines. But the idea is to create chaos and to make the people around the person with the problem question themselves so that they'll back off. You know, the old saying, uh, the best defense is a good offense. I think gaslighting uh, does a lot of that. So strategies for those of us that work with a lot of people with personality disorders, being able to let go of the personal aspect of this, being able to let go of the illusion that we can control that person or help that person um, become better. Self-care, how do we take care of ourselves? People with personality disorders can be very draining to work with. And then when we're drained and our defenses are low, that's when we're, we're prone to uh, act maybe in an unprofessional manner or just not to be particularly effective. We don't wanna get pulled into uh, the chaos. And what we really wanna do is invest ourselves in the process day by day of helping that person get better, see what they're doing isn't working and be open to the idea of change. So a couple summarizing points, uh, people with personality disorders are everywhere, whether you work in a mental health setting, an inpatient setting or not, and they do require uh, attention. Uh, people, people with borderline and with antisocial personality disorders tend to be in facilities in much higher numbers. So if you work in a facility like that, you are already familiar with these. Personality disorders are particularly difficult to treat because of how ingrained they are, because they don't respond to medication, because of, remember the, the term egocentonic, the person's okay with it. Um, and of course, the exciting acting out behaviors that come along with it. And critical that we as caregivers take care of ourselves, set boundaries, and have a consistent team approach. Again, we don't want to get split off from the herd. We need to be one team and working with the person so that their acting out behavior doesn't benefit results. So here's some of the resources that were used on this presentation. I wanted to take a minute to recommend uh, uh, Dr. Caviola and Lavender's book, Toxic Coworkers. Uh, that gives a multi-dimensional approach to all of the personality disorders and how it works when it's your coworker or your supervisor. So a very good real world, real workplace uh, look at personality disorders. Um, then uh, the other one I wanted to point out, I mentioned before about uh, DBT. I wanted to put up some of Marsha Linehan's work. So this is a starting uh, point for that. Uh, in case you have, in case you want to look at that any further so that you can attend better to the people with personality disorders in your facility. Anyway, nice talking to you as always. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for other uh, materials that we can cover. And we'll catch up with you next time.